Welcome back. I hope you had a little break, some libation, something to eat on because we have an exciting afternoon. At this time, I'd like to introduce the next uh, presenter or he's going to um, just kind of facilitate our next session. He's the distinguished research scientist at the CCME and it's Dr. Stephen Murray. Dr. Murray, you there? Thank Ready you, Dr. To go. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Today, we're excited to hear from four more Cooperative Science Center scholars. During the talks, please type your questions in the Q&A window and I'll relay them to the speakers um, after they finish their talks. The first speaker today is an alumna of the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems, or CCME, who recently earned her master's degree from California State University, Monterey Bay. Alexandra Thompson is now a California Sea Grant State Fellow with the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. The title of Alexandra's talk is Integrating Remote Sensing and Field Methods to Understand Natural Vegetation Colonization and Tidal Marsh Restoration. Alexandra? Thank you, Dr. Mori. All right, I'm hoping you can all see my screen and hear me okay. So, Dr. Mori, introduce the title of my talk, so I won't go over that. I just want to thank you for inviting me here to tell you a little bit about my graduate research. So I'd first like to acknowledge um, the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems Program for funding my fellowship. My research was a collaboration with the Elkhorn Flu National Estuary and Research Reserve, and I'd also like to thank the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which hosted my NERTO internship. I'd also like to acknowledge that this research was conducted on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Amamutsun and other tribes, acknowledging that this is their land and they are still alive and present today. So I conducted my graduate research on tidal marsh restoration because significant wetland loss has occurred worldwide, including across the United States, and a loss in these wetland areas results in a loss of the many benefits provided by tidal marshes and other wetlands. Um, these benefits include things like carbon sequestration, water filtration, and providing habitat for many species of wildlife. A lot of these historical losses were due to direct conversion of marshes and other wetlands for agriculture and development, but remaining marshes face additional threats, including sea level rise because the marsh plants can't survive such prolonged inundation. One approach to addressing these historical losses and the existing threats to marshes, including sea level rise, is to conduct restoration high in the tidal frame. So rather than restoring a marsh to resemble current marshes with a large marsh plain area that gets flooded daily, we can restore marshes to be at the upper elevational limits of what marsh vegetation can currently occupy with the idea that these areas will then remain vegetated for longer and have more time to adapt to sea level rise. And we can also locate these in areas with a gentle slope um, to the side of the marsh so that as the sea level rises, marsh vegetation can migrate upslope. So you may be wondering, how do we conduct restoration that's high in the tidal frame when a lot of the marshes that we want to restore are currently low? And one option is to use sediment addition to raise the marsh elevation. So we can place sediment or soil on top of a degraded and subsided marsh plain that has become too low to support healthy plants. And this sediment addition will raise it up to a higher and more resilient elevation. This approach is being implemented by the Elkhorn Slough Reserve at the Hester Marsh Restoration Site, a 25 hectare or 62 acre site in Elkhorn Slough, which is in Central California. I collaborated with the Elkhorn Slough Reserve to monitor this site using field methods and remote sensing to track restoration success in order to inform future restoration. And I looked at a couple of different things as part of my research, including survival of the buried plants, development of vegetation cover over the first year of restoration, 
and the environmental factors associated with new colonization by plants. So I'm going to touch on survival of buried vegetation, but my talk will mostly focus on analysis of what environmental factors were associated with newly colonized plants. To give some background, Hester Marsh was historically very well vegetated with marsh plants, but due to various human influences, it had degraded and subsided to mostly unvegetated mudflat represented by this tan area. And so restoration occurred and brought in a bunch of sediment, added it on top of this degraded marsh plain to raise it up to its current high elevation. Tidal creeks were dug in following sediment addition to resemble the historical creek network. And this large marsh plain area was left unplanted with the idea that tides would bring in seeds that would be deposited on the marsh plain and they would grow into new plants. So active planting was limited to this area on the western side of the site. One key takeaway is that very little vegetation survived sediment addition. Elkhorn Slough's research coordinator, Kirstine Wasson and I were able to walk around the entire site two to three months after construction ended and use a handheld GPS to log all of the places where we found plants that had survived construction as points in the GPS. And I'm hoping that the fact that we were able to use that method to record the surviving plants gives you an idea of just how bare the site was. And there might be a couple reasons for the little vegetation survival, including the thickness of the sediment that was added on top of the former marsh, and also the fact that heavy construction equipment was used in order to place the sediment out on the marsh. Once new plants started coming in, um, we started seeing pretty interesting patterns with some areas that were becoming quickly very densely vegetated while other areas remained pretty bare. And so I used a combination of field and remote sensing techniques to try to understand this variability. The field methods included surveys of vegetation cover in quadrats along these 10 transects spread around the marsh. Um, this was a total of about 280 quadrats. And then the remote sensing approach included unoccupied aircraft systems or UAS surveys with a quadcopter drone shown here. And that's Elkhorn Slough Reserve drone operator in the background. So I used high resolution drone imagery collected about a year into the restoration and I classified it using ArcGIS software into vegetated and unvegetated areas shown on the right here. And then I created 300 one meter square plots and calculated the classified vegetation cover in each of those plots. And that was my UAS vegetation data set. So I modeled the effects of nine predictors on new vegetation cover, including elevation, salinity, distance to tidal creeks and various factors relating to the sediment addition process and the site history. And I conducted this modeling using random forest modeling for the transect survey data set and also separately for the UAS data set. And so conducting the same type of modeling with the same predictors on two different data sets enabled me to consider what some of the differences are in the data collection techniques. We ended up finding similar modeling results for the transect and UAS vegetation data in what predictors turned out to be important for the models, which predictors were more versus less important, and also the relationships between each predictor and the related vegetation cover data set. So on the top here, these are the important predictors from the transect model, and on the bottom, the predictors that were important for the UAS model. And what I want to highlight here is that the most important predictors for both models were related to the elevation of the marsh following sediment addition, and also a related factor, which was inundation frequency. So basically, we were finding more plants 
at the higher elevation, very infrequently inundated areas on the marsh. And I'll show a little example of this on my next slide. Just to wrap this all up, we found very little vegetation survived sediment addition, possibly due to the thickness of sediment added or the method of sediment placement with heavy construction equipment. We found similar modeling results for transect and UAS vegetation data, indicating that both methods were suitable for monitoring this site, and the combination of the two was especially helpful for my research. But under budget limitations, transect or other field monitoring may be more optimal for sites this size or smaller, while UAS monitoring may be more optimal for larger or less accessible sites. Finally, we found that elevation and inundation frequency were particularly important um, predictors and considerations for future restoration projects. So this is a drone image um, of the marsh about a year into the restoration. These dark spots are the plants, the newly colonized plants. The white areas are tidal creeks and on top of the drone image is a semi-transparent digital elevation model with the areas above 1.93 meters in elevation shown in orange. And you can see that the plants overlap pretty well with those orange areas, which were inundated less than 1% of the time over the first year of restoration. And this is an important finding because it can help inform the target elevation for future sediment addition projects. I wanna conclude by expressing my gratitude for being able to conduct this applied research as a NOAA CCME graduate fellow in collaboration with the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. I wanna thank all of my collaborators and advisors and I can take questions. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That's a great example of application of some of the NOAA strategies for research that we heard about earlier, including UAS and machine learning uh, approaches. As a reminder to all the attendees, um, you can pose questions to Alexandra and any of the speakers in the chat box or in the Q&A window. There's a little icon probably at the bottom of your screen. Well, Alexandra, I'd like to congratulate you on your new position as a California Sea Grant State Fellow. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what you'll be doing or are doing in that position and um, any relation it might have to the research you completed as a CCME scholar. Yeah, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, so I started as a California Sea Grant Fellow in January of this year. One of the big projects I'm working on is somewhat related to my thesis research. Um, I'm helping to develop a wetlands regional monitoring program for the San Francisco Estuary. Um, again, my host is the San Francisco Estuary Partnership in the Bay Area in California. And so this wetlands regional monitoring program, the goal of it is to take monitoring data from a bunch of different restoration sites um, and be able to compile it all in one place so that more research can be done on it to understand what makes a restoration site successful. Um, and also ambient monitoring at non-restoration sites just to see how wetlands in the area are changing over time. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alexandra. The next speaker today is Sui Ortiz-Rosa of the NOAA Center for Earth System Sciences and Remote Sensing Technologies and a PhD student at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez. Sui's talk is entitled, Evaluation of Ocean Color Models Using Landsat AOLI Imagery for the Caribbean. Sui? Uh, yes, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, let me share my screen. Sorry that probably you are hearing uh, noise in the background, but 
it is out of my control. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here presenting uh, the project that I've been working in collaboration with Dr. Christopher Brown and Dr. Juan Minsen from No Anestis as part of my NERTO project. This is a piece of the NERTO project and also a piece of my dissertation. With this project, we aim to estimate the remote sensing reflectance and the chlorophyll concentration using algorithms readily available in CEDA software. And we determine the usefulness of these L2 gene products at local and regional scale in the Caribbean region. We focus on Southwestern Puerto Rico to validate these algorithms. And in terms of the potential use of the result, I think that any child monitoring based on a remote sensing reflectance to derive other parameters is relevant to detect anomalies at small scale in a spatial resolution. And also the products are indicators of marine health conditions and play a role in resource management decisions. Also these measurements can be used to monitor the required conditions for coral reef farms or to detect non-point source of pollution or to complement coral reef ecosystem studies. Remote sensing imagery has been used for oceanic and coastal monitoring for a long time. And now satellite sensors like B revisit the area daily, but however, the sensors in some cases doesn't have the enough of a spatial resolution to detect the patterns with details, but this high resolution data is available from sensors designed for land imagery, such as Landsat, and we explore the use of uh, this sensor for quick analysis at 30 meters in coastal waters. Few studies validated this information in coastal environments, including shallow waters in uh, with coral reef zones. And this remote sensing reflectance is basic for ocean color observations. This sensor provides four bands in the visible range and one band in the near infrared and one in the short um, near infrared uh, for atmospheric correction purpose. This is a quick view of the study area and the sampling stations uh, for Data validation are located from Guanica Bay to La Parguera Natural Reserve, and some of them are close to the Keys, but most of them are located in relative shallow waters. For this project, I analyzed a level one imagery in GOT format using the l 2 gene 2 Ocean Color Suite for CEDAS, uh, and made especially for CEDAS software. First, I evaluated the documentation on atmospheric correction and see the software with focus on relevant information in remote sensing reflectance and chlorophyll values. And second, I went into the details in the processing options to detect the errors and to select the correct parameters. Next, the next step was to process and include a spectral radiometer field data applying the following equation, which is defined as the ratio of water living radiance to the total downwelling irradiance just above the water surface. The data set includes five images out of 14, and these were the best imagery with mashup data from the same day for validation purpose. But um, certainly the software uh, has many advantages and one of them is the flag or masking option. For example, it's important uh, to visualize the glint effect. Here in the figure A, uh, shows the moderate sun glint over the Caribbean. Uh, as you can see, not every image um, is going to work for regional and local analysis at the same time. Here you can see some of the products in this figure panel, and you can see the glint on the RGB image in the figure D. But now looking at the Southwestern Puerto Rico subset of the same image, we can have a detailed view of the product in shallow waters. But um, now the question is, how good is the product? 
And the next step was to compare with field values and employ some corrections. For example, in the first graph, you can see the box plot with reflectances values and the field data is represented only here with the uh, wavelength number. And the graph B is an example of one specific site and one specific date. And the line in magenta represent the field data above the water surface. The black and red dots shows the Landsat A value with different parameters. And the most important is the blue dot. And these are adjusted values applying a correction factor related to the field data magnitude. And this magnitude is modified for each wavelength. And this is a, the correction factor. The change is evident in the first two bands and the figure A is the uncorrected image at 443 nanometers and B is the adjusted reflectance while the figure C shows the second band uh, and D is after the correction, but these modifications are not so evident in the next two bands. But to evaluate these differences, I analyzed data applying some statistical tests. I started with a distribution fit, which run normality, means and variance, and generate probability plots, ending with interpolations. But the analysis is not completed without the metrics. And for this purpose, I started calculating the percent of difference. But uh, here, uh, I applied three um, publications with different metrics that are similar among them. For example, way and collaborator for bias equation and the mean absolute percent of difference also for the symmetric mean absolute uh, error. But subsequently a mashup between field data and pixel was performed and these values were extracted from one-to-one -one pixel to maintain a reduced spatial resolution. And a summary of the linear FET model by BAN is in figure A. The slope and the intercept are shown in the equation over the plot while the statistic output is on the table. And the R square is low for the first band, only 0.27. And the highest was in the band at uh, 561 nanometers with 0.38. In terms of the mean absolute percent of difference, we obtained low values for, for the first three bands, what is good. And at the first band, it was only 8%, but in the red band was greater than 100%. And now this graph below show the remote sensing reflectance values for each band by side for the complete data set. And the second bar for each one is um, the value after applying the regression model. And you can see the red band in magenta with negative values and how it changed after the fitting. Now the last objective was to validate the chlorophyll in products. And for this purpose, um, we retrieve uh, information about different um, models. For example, in figure A, you have the GSM a model showing no data for low chlorophyll values, but the model retrieved values on shallow waters where the bottom can be seen. On the other hand, the chlorophyll, value, uh, chlorophyll algorithms or OSHI products overestimate the values in shallow waters. And uh, the metrics are summarized here in the table and considering the results of other article, our bias uh, is equal to the bias across all waters, OC3, and um, OSHI in oligotrophic waters. Also the mean absolute error median is lower than published values. It's, it indicates only a variability of 6.8% across all chlorophyll values. In terms of the linear regression, the low R square only 0.12 is comparable with other algorithms in oligotrophic waters that are in the um, literature. But uh, but certainly we cannot rely only in R-square values. Uh, and the most important 
uh, an interesting result is when I apply the correction factor to the one, band one and band two, proceeding with the linear regression. For example, here we have um, the, the ratio, the band ratio, the second image is the ratio between uh, both with including the linear regression and there is the GSM model uh, product. And the last one is uh, the chlorophyll overestimating the waters. And this scatter plot is between the second image and OC2 products. And most of the values lower than 0.4 are matched with negative values from the new products. And is highlighted for specific sites in the tables that are located in deep waters. But instead to be focused on deep waters that we already know that uh, this algorithm works well. Uh, be focused on the shallow waters, that is our um, study area. And considering data from this polygon on the shelf in shallow water, we can obtain this histogram and the statistic data. Looking at the mean values, you can uh, see the differences in, in, in the models that L2Gen provide versus our new product. And um, uh, but in general, you can notice the differences. But with this slide, I'm concluding this graph present the chlorophyll values and remote sensing reflectance at four band by sampling site. I apply the correction factor, but this time to the gains on the image processing, obtaining new values for all the selected products. And the chlorophyll values from adjusted gains are closer to the field values, in some cases lower than the field data, meaning that these gains may not be applied for all imagery. Um, with these new gains, the negative values are not presented for chlorophyll values in deep water. But the next step is to compare them with the ratio previously computed uh, and the remote sensing reflectance with field values to complete the metrics. I want to highlight here that these are examples and it is an ongoing project. Also, it is important to remember that our field data represent a small coastal area with sampling sites located above the shelf, but further analysis, including oceanic waters, uh, could be completed with the same imagery. And the main goal here for this project was limited to determine the usefulness of CDAS and to validate the remote sensing reflectance data as the base to retrieve accurate products. Now, I just want to say thank you again to my mentors, to search staff and my lab mates and advisor for their support in many ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, I was wondering how prevalent is sargassum in this region and how could that impact the chlorophyll estimates from the Landsat? Is I think that the sargassum is, is seasonal, it's not always there, but uh, yes, we see an increase uh, in the chlorophyll values when sargassum arrives to the area, but we also know that is part of the ecological processes. Uh, and also we take it in consideration when we are analyzing uh, the satellite imagery and the field data also. Okay, great, thank you. Appreciate that talk. Next, we'll hear from Sarah Hildebrandt of the NOAA Living Marine Resources Cooperative Science Center. Sarah is a master's student at Hampton University. The title of Sierra's talk today is Investigating the Impacts of Oyster Conditioned Water on Crassostria virginica, Larval Direct Settling Efficiency. Sierra? Hi, everyone. Um, you should now be able to see my screen. So um, thank you for that introduction. As mentioned, my name is Sierra Hildebrandt and I'm a master's student at Hampton University under Dr. Deidre Gibson. And today I'm going to be discussing my MS research, also part of my NERTO research, which is investigating the impacts of oyster condition water on Crossostria virginica larval direct setting efficiency. Sorry, I'm just gonna pull all of these 
things down below so I can see my full screen. So to begin, an introduction to the Eastern Oyster. The Eastern Oyster, Chrysostra virginica, is a predominantly coastal bivalve that inhabits intertidal and shallow subtidal zones of estuaries, bays, and marshes from the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. And the Eastern Oyster can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. It's typically found in salinities from five to 40 parts per thousand and then temperatures ranging from negative two to 36 degrees Celsius. However, um, 14 to 28 parts per thousand are the optimal salinity ranges and then growth rates are highest in temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius. So oysters have a bipartite life cycle. So as you see in this figure on your left, adult oysters are broadcast spawners and they release eggs and sperm into the water column where fertilization occurs. And then a trochophore larvae will develop. Typically for two to three weeks, this pelagic larvae is drifting through the water column, feeding on phytoplankton and other particulate matter until a foot develops at this larval stage. So the Petty Bellinger stage, as you see right here in your top right corner of that figure, um, with that foot, the larvae will congregate to the benthos and search for suitable habitat, typically sea virginic oyster shell to attach to. And then if that substrate is suitable, the larvae will then submit themselves and metamorphose into basically a baby oyster or spat. So through this repeated process, the um, large oyster reefs are formed. So for the study, we're really focusing on the petty bellinger stage and to that early spat stage. So oysters are incredibly important because as ecosystem engineers, they provide a number of ecosystem services and goods. So this table outlines ecosystem services provided by oysters and includes improvements in water quality by removing the chlorophyll A, as well as reduced turbidity and then denitrification. Oysters also provide seashore stabilization through dampening wave energy and serve as a carbon sink, in addition to providing habitat for oysters, invertebrates, and other epibenthic fauna. Um, so in the Chesapeake Bay, the oyster population is currently thought to be less than 1% of historical values. And this estimation is largely based on reduced landings between Maryland and Virginia. So as you can see in this figure to your right, the landings in pounds have decreased since the mid 20th century. And this decline is largely due to exhaustive and destructive oyster harvesting techniques combined with poor water quality, as well as habitat loss and disease. So because of the importance of the oysters, various federal and state agencies have developed strategic plans to restore the Eastern oyster population throughout the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. And then going back to this figure on your right, you can see that your landings are starting to increase in the 2000s, and that is largely due to the restoration efforts. So currently the traditional method for restoration aquaculture purposes is remote setting. So in remote setting, oyster larvae are produced in a hatchery and then they are transported to a secondary location for a grow out stage where the larvae are released onto oyster shell in a tank to produce spat on shell. That spat on shell is then brought to a third location for planting. Um, and this method has proven to be effective. However, it is expensive and requires a large amount of substrate. So as that C. virginica shell becomes more limiting and also alternative substrates became more readily available, these costs will increase. So one potential to reduce cost as well as substrate is this idea of direct setting. So in direct setting, you can reduce these costs and again, substrate use by reducing steps in the traditional remote setting and you can get the hatchery produced larvae and transport them on a small boat to the plant, to the restoration site and then directly set them onto an oyster reef. So direct setting has shown success. In 1989, Kuhn and Fit released oyster larvae pre-treated with L-DOPA, a chemical cue known to induce settlement. And they thought that they were successful. However, they were unable to distinguish natural set from the experimental set. Step and all in 2016, they wanted to test if direct setting would produce setting efficiencies comparable to that traditional remote setting that was just discussed. So they direct set C. virginica larvae 
in an enclosed system in the field, and they did find setting efficiencies comparable to that 10 to 20 percent found in the traditional remote setting. And then more recently, in a project I participated in in 2019 with Spires, <laughs> um, we a method was developed to tech or to chemically mark oyster larvae with a calcium used to mark otoliths and fish, and we were able to use this basically chemical mark to distinguish the natural set from the wild set, and also we're able to show that direct setting was possible in an open system. So although direct setting has shown success, there are still methods needed to fully develop this technique as a restoration tool. So one idea, as we saw in that first direct setting by Kuhn and Fit, is this idea of chemically cueing larvae to settle. So in the environment, chemical cues can originate from a variety of sources in the marine environment. And one source of cues are metabolites released by adult oysters. This OCW has shown to induce settlement behavior in oyster larvae in the laboratory. And you can basically isolate these metabolites released by these adult oysters by bathing them in water. So you can think of it almost like an oyster broth. So for my project, I hypothesized that C. virginica oyster larvae could be pre-treated with OCW. And through those pre-treatment, you would have a higher setting efficiency in the field. So specifically, I conducted laboratory experiments to determine appropriate OCW concentrations for enhanced setting efficiency and then confirm those concentrations in the field. And this research directly aims to enhance current oyster restoration efforts while reducing cost. So for my research, all laboratory experiments were conducted in the Hampton University Marine Science Oyster Restoration Laboratory. And then all of my direct setting field studies were conducted in the Hampton River off HU's campus, which is indicated by this white star. So going into my laboratory methods, in the lab, 12 settlement chambers were prepared by placing 22 oyster shells into each chamber, and then a low OCW treatment, a medium OCW treatment, and a high OCW treatment was prepared by bathing either 18, 36, or 72 adult oysters in artificial seawater for 12 hours. So after the 12 hour bath, the oysters were removed, and then that remaining solution was divided into four liter aliquots and then placed into the appropriate settlement chamber. And for all the laboratory and field experiments, the control was used with artificial seawater. So after the OCW was separated, 1400 oyster larvae were then added to each settlement chamber and allowed seven days to settle. After the seven days, all shells were examined using a light microscope for a spat on shell. And then that number was used to calculate setting efficiency. So in the first lab experiment, my setting efficiencies were lower than what was cited in the literature. And so in this first experiment, you can see your ammonium levels down here below. They were um, also higher than what was also cited in the literature. And so from what I had read, the ammonium levels were potentially toxic at this larval stage. And additionally, I had oysters die in all of my OCW treatments. So because of that, I thought that I could potentially have a lower setting efficiency. So I did the experiment again. And this time, I reduced my bath time to four hours, and I used filtered river water instead of the artificial seawater to reduce the ammonium concentration, as well as the stress to the oysters. And what I found from that second experiment is that I had higher setting efficiencies and the low and medium treatments than the actual control. So in the control, you see I had a 28% setting efficiency. And then in the low and medium, I had a 33% and a 38%. And then that high OCW concentration, I had a much lower average setting efficiency of 19%. And when I went back to my notes from the lab experiment, I still had oysters die in that OC, OCW four hour bath. So I thought that maybe potentially a chemical cue was again released and decreased setting efficiency. So using the results from the laboratory experiment, I decided to, in the field, test the low and high OCW concentration against the control.
So going into my direct sending field methods, we conducted two field experiments, one as a pilot and then one as a final experiment. So in both experiments, oyster trays were placed into the Hampton River in Virginia at the Hampton University study site. And in the first experiment, loose oyster shells were placed on each side of the oyster trays. <clears throat> the trays are pictured here in this first photo and then also in the second photo. And then <clears throat> in the second experiment, loose oyster shells were placed on only one side of the oyster trays. So larvae that were pre-treated with either that control, low or high OCW were released using a direct setting release method at slack low tide in the center of each shell bag. And then one month after um, larval deployment, all of the shells in each of the trays were examined for spat on shell. As you can see in this photo to the right in the red circle, there's about one, two, three, four, five, five um, spat on the shell. So going into my results for my direct sending experiment, in the first experiment, I found that the low and high OCW treatments resulted in a lower setting efficiency than the control. And we had an average setting efficiency of 1.3% for the control and then a 0.82% and a 0.44% in the high. And during this experiment at our study site, we actually experienced a cochlidinium bloom, so a harmful algal bloom. And this specific species has shown to increase mortality in oyster larvae to 80 to 90% as well as slow development and growth. Um, additionally, at this life stage, oyster larvae have increased sensitivity. So I'm thinking that the oyster larvae either had increased sensitivity because of the exposure to the OCW and made them more susceptible to the impacts of the bloom. So from these results, I did the experiment again. And this time with optimal salinity and temperature as well as no bloom, <laughs> we found that OCW and the low and high treatments did result in higher setting efficiencies. So as you can see in that control, we had the average setting efficiency of 0.67%, while in the low and the high, we had a 0.94 and a 1.3%. So just some take home points, um, and I've shown you that OCW has shown to be an effective inducer of settlement in bivalves in the laboratory, as discussed in previous papers. However, virtually no studies have been done to understand the impacts of OCW on larval settlement in the field. So in the study, we showed that C. virginia larvae could be induced to settle in the field after exposure to various concentrations of OCW. However, there are inconsistencies between the setting efficiency results. So further studies are needed to fully understand the ability of OCW to enhance larval setting efficiencies in the field. Um, and thank you all for coming to my talk today, um, as well as thank you to the NOAA LMR CSC, as well as my advisors, collaborators, and many others who have helped complete this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sierra. Again, to all the um, attendees, if you'd like to pose a question to Sierra, you can do so in the Q&A box or in the chat window, and I'll see those as well. Um, Sierra, I have, a, I have a question. In the um, field experiments, how do you control for advective losses? So when you put the, the larva in the water, you know, there are currents, and how right. can that impact your results, and would they impact the control as well as the... Um, your different treatments similarly? Yeah, um, so I, in previous experiments, they would put up a turbidity boom to try to keep all the larvae released in that area. However, I have read in other people and other papers, they would release at slack low tide because that was when there was the least current activity. And also if you're on a deeper reef, maybe not one that was as, you know, in a shallow area as where I was, you would have less flow over that reef. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. The final student speaker today is Angelique Rosamarine of the NOAA Center for Coastal Marine Ecosystems. Angelique is a master's student at Florida A&M University. Angelique will be talking about environmental assessment in coral reefs at Hobos Bay, Puerto Rico. Angelique? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Morey, for that wonderful introduction. 
Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, let's start talking a little bit about our climate emergency. I'm assuming that at this point, everyone heard about this and know about this. Um, obviously, we understand that different global stressors are affecting coral reef ecosystems, especially marine pollution, ocean acidification, and ocean warming. And from a local perspective, we have a lot of non-point pollution, terrestrial runoff, and urban development that are affecting our coral reef ecosystems. So with that in mind, what we can do? In my case, I'm proposing to use uh, benthic foraminifers as an indicator tool for coral reefs. Uh, but first of all, let's talk a little bit what, about what are benthic foraminifers. So they are protists and they are microscopic and they also have a carbonate calcium um, shell. And also you can find them usually in many, many marine um, environments, especially coral reefs, estuaries, sea grasses, um, beaches, and among other things. Um, but now why, why we can use them as a bioindicator? One of the main things it's because this kind of organism is very susceptible and or resilient to different environmental stressors, which makes which make it a very good um, indicator tool. And also another reason is for their short life cycle. Thanks to that, it make it easy to be accessible, accessible to this uh, to these organism and also for statistical um, purposes. And with that in mind, um, an ecological index called the Foraminifera Reef Assessment Monitoring Index, alias the Foram Index, was created in 2003. And the rationale about this index is that when you are going to apply this, you need to divide the foraminifers in three main morpho groups. The first one are the most important ones for this ecological index and is the symbiont bearing foraminifers. These are the ones that are more similar to, to the coral biology, especially because these ones uh, has um, symbiotic relationships with other microalgae. And also you can find them in low nutrient level ecosystems such as coral reefs. The other group is the heterotrophic um, taxa. This kind of foraminifer uh, requires a high uh, food source and also they are not uh, too dependent to light, de uh, to light as well. And also the other group is the opportunistic one. And this group is very well known to be like the stress tolerant uh, taxa um, inside of the benthic uh, foraminifers. And you can find these foraminifers in, <laughs> in everywhere. <laughs> um, you can find them in very abundant organic matter sediments and also in places where the oxygen concentration is very, very low. So with that in mind, how we apply right, this index. So after dividing our foraminifers in those three morpho groups, we need to uh, apply this very basic um, formula. And for that, we need to calculate the relative abundance of each morpho group. After applying the formula, we are going to obtain a foram index value. The scale of this, um, of this index goes from zero to 10. After having our value, we can interpret uh, our value. And for example, if we got a foram index value below than two, that means that the conditions of that environment are not suitable for reef recovery or reef um, development. Uh, for example, if we got a uh, foram index value greater than four, that means that the conditions of that environment are suitable for reef uh, recovery. So with all this background, the objective, uh, yeah, the, my objective of, the, of my thesis project is first of all, test if the foram index can be used as a seasonal water uh, long-term biomonitoring tool in the Hobos National Research Reserve. 
and also test if any physical chemical parameter in the area are influencing these uh, farm index values with the aim to assess the current cutoff reef conditions at the bay. So my study site, as I mentioned, is the East Hobos Bay. Um, this is a national research reserve that is part of the NEAR network and it's located in the southwest uh, part of the island of Puerto Rico. I'm working especially in these two reefs here. This first one is Cayo Morillos, Cayo Pajaros, and I'm working in this side of Cayo Caribes. Our sampling um, design was very straightforward. In our three reefs, we delineate between two and three transits in the front and in the back of each reef. And in each transit, we have between two and three um, stations. In those stations, we measure um, physical chemical parameters using a YSI, meaning temperature, DO, salinity, and among others. After that, we filter um, the seawater using an in situ uh, inline pump system. And after that, we collect our sediments uh, in two ways, depending on the coral coverage in each station. Uh, we dive if we needed to dive. If not, we use a dredge. My, our lab work, uh, we, the, some of the analysis that we made was uh, analysis for total suspended solids, concentration of nutrients, grain size, carbonate calcium, total organic carbon, and of course, for foraminifera, we need to sort them and also identify them in order to apply the foram index and also for ecological index indexes analysis. So this is a oh sorry, uh, first slide of results here. Uh, we have the physical chemical uh, parameters by reef. In green, we have March 2019, and in yellow, we have September 2019. And I just want to highlight four points in this table. The first one is that we, uh, we identify a seasonal variation in the temperature between March and, and September. That's the first square that we can see here. The second uh, main point is uh, concentrations of the total suspended solid were higher in the stations that were inside of the bay, meaning stations that were in the back of the reef. And we found greater concentrations of total suspended solids in the solid in the stations, I'm sorry, of the front of the reef. For the TOC, which is the organic uh, carbon component, we also find higher concentrations in the stations that were inside of the of the bay and the carbonate calcium was the whole opposite the concentrations were higher in stations that were in front of the reef and another interesting finding was the nitrates we saw a significant um, variation on nitrates concentrations between season we found a very low concentration in march however a very high concentration in september uh, for the farming, uh, farm index values, um, in this graph, we have in the x, um, in the x axis, we have the depth of the, of the stations. And in the y axis, we have the farm index values. Each point represent uh, the, the stations that were, uh, that were analyzed in September and March. Okay, so for to understand this graph, everything that is below the line, uh, right here of number two means that the conditions of those stations of those reefs were not uh, good for coral development or coral survivorship. Anything that is between the two and four means that the environment is a stress, but we have some hope that they can recover. And anything that is above number four, which is gonna be all this, that means that the conditions in the reef are suitable for reef um, development, recovery, or even survivorship. However, unfortunately, um, and that is why I'm highlighting some of the, some, uh, the stations here in red, um, most of the samples, uh, the density in forms was very, very, very low. And that was a problem that, that we are experiencing because in order to validate the forum index and actually use it, and suggest the coral uh, health, 
um, we need to find 150 individuals per gram. And unfortunately, any of these samples, especially these three, doesn't accomplish that. We also um, create a correlation because we wanted to see, as I mentioned before, if any physical parameter was influencing the foram index value. And we found that two parameters are influencing the values in a negative way, which was which is uh, the trust suspended solids and the grain size of the sediments, which makes completely um, sense for us. This was a result that we were expecting because if we have a higher concentration of thrust suspended solids in the water, that means that the turbidity of the water is gonna increase as well. And that kind of conditions are not suitable for the symbiont bearing foraminifers, which are the ones that are more related with corals. It's gonna favorable the presence of organisms such as the heterotrophic and the opportunistic taxa. And that's gonna play a role in lowering the foram index values. Here we have two graphs. And this is the Shannon index in, in this, in the, in the left, we have March. And in the September, in the right, we have uh, September. In overall, in March, we found a range of species going from one to 30. And in September, from three to 16. And in overall, we see in this graph that in September, the distribution of forums was lower than in March. Here we have the ifness of again of the same the same seasons and here i just want to highlight two things um, unfortunately here we we have two outliers in march because the same reason of the density um, in these samples the density of forums was very low and the number of species was basically the same so that is why we are getting this high value on ethnes but actually it doesn't it's it's they're, they're outliers and another um, highlight is that between the reefs, the in Cayo Morillo, which is the purple um, square, is the reef that is experiencing the lowest ifness. And with all this in mind, we I, I just want to share with you three main um, takeaways. The, fir the first one is that the firm index is not valid in most of the stations, uh, with the ones that are in front of the reef do the low foraminifera density. The second um, takeaway is that the foraminifera is not an adequate tool in March and September to be applied in Hobos Bay. And also that the total suspended solids and the grain size influence in the foraminifera values. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And of course, I would like to thank, uh, wow, too many people, too many entities that plays a, a very important role in my research. First of all, no one is seeing me, basically fund me to complete my master. Uh, FAMU and also Sea Grant Puerto Rico, which also was a funding agency in my research. Thank you so much and I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Angelique. Um, great presentation, great work. So it seems to me that the takeaway is the forum index is not such a useful um, tool for the times that you are there sampling, right? For the moment, yes. Right. Um, are, there, are there other ecological indices that you think might be beneficial for understanding um, you know, changes in the coral reefs? In this yeah, region? of course. Actually, um, I'm just showing 25% uh, of my data. <laughs> um, and that's something that, uh, that has a further directions, we need to implement the other seasons that we sample. And hopefully to see if we if, if we see something from them. We're still missing December and also we're still missing a whole year from 2019. Um, but answering your question, um, for the data that I'm analyzing now, uh, no, I don't think in terms of ecologically speaking, I don't think that any other ec ecological index can give us more information because the issue that we are experiencing is that the density of the forums is so low that we cannot even create like a concrete conclusion about, mm -hmm. about that. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers for today's session. Uh, this has been an excellent experience to get a taste of the, uh, some of the work being done by the Cooperative Science Center students. Um, we look forward to a large number of student presentations at the second phase of the forum in the fall.